This is Michael McQuistion, composer for Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-12. Hello team, welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode 6 of Whelmed Season 3. My name's Rich, and with me is my co-host Emily. Hi everyone. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, themes, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else about Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes of this season, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. You're sure they went to Infinity Island? The one place we very specifically told them not to go? Yep. Well... What goes around comes around. What's that supposed to mean? Uh, Cadmus ring any bells? Oh, man. I hate being the grown-up. And with that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily Forb. Hello, Megan. The title of this week's episode is Rescue Op. The release date was January 11th, 2019. The in-episode date was August 5th. The writer was Joshua Hale Fialkov. I think that's how we're saying it. Fialkov, yeah. <laughs> Until until we are corrected right. by him coming on the show and right. telling us how to say his name. That is how we will say his name. <laughs> Speaking of names. And the, the director d- <laughs> was another one of the ones that I seemingly can't pronounce. Uh, right. Vinton Huk. Huk. Uh, yeah, I also- sent I sent him a message and said, can you please help us? <laughs> we don't want to mangle your name anymore. We're so sorry. And the voice director, Jamie Thomason. All right, special guest voice credits this week. In addition to the returning team cast from the first couple of seasons, we have Oded Fair returning as Rachel Ghoul. Josh Keaton returns as Black Spider, as well as the Red Hooded Ninja and Wilhelm Vittings. I'll get into him a little bit in a bit. Josh Keaton, in case you didn't catch it in our first two seasons of uh, voicing Black Spider, is basically the Into the Spider-Verse DC version of Peter Parker. And he's evil. That's basically <laughs> it. And Josh Keaton did the voice of Spectacular Spider-Man in Craig Weissman's other Spectacular Spider-Man show. He's just evil Spider-Man. He is evil Spider-Man. Black Sp- he, he's not evil Spider-Man like – they didn't change his personality. He's still like quippy and yep. like jokey. He's, and, he's like, literally that kind of just sp- Spider-Man <laughs> if he was evil. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to watch. And then we also have Kion Young uh, returns as Sensei as well. Just in time for your next mission. So, this week's episode starts in the capital city of Bialya, where we see a man stumble out of a party wearing the ubiquitous good goggles. <laughs> the man, Jakar Marlowe, finds himself face to face with Black Spider, an assassin from the League of Shadows. And Marlowe runs through the twisting streets and back alleys, losing the assassin only to have a boulder the size of a small house <laughs> drop on him out of nowhere. Black Spider tells the silhouette of a young teen that they did a good job and that all of their bosses will be impressed. And then we go to the title sequence with so many questions. Just no chill in that rock. Like it could have been, doesn't take that big a rock to kill somebody. (laughs) That guy is super gone. Uh, Our next scene gives us our first look at Barbara Gordon for season three, former Batgirl and current Oracle as she plays a game on her good goggles. I'm sure it'll be fine. Dick Grayson tries to sneak up on her, but finds himself thrown. Uh, We get confirmation that Dick and Barbara are in a relationship when their banter is interrupted by an alert from Barbara's computer. We then cut to Brion and Halo walking in the orchard, and eventually Connor and McGann joining them, introducing Forager. During the meeting, Halo somehow just tells everyone about New Genesis, Apocalypse, and Forager's people. Yep. That's yep. what she does. That's the thing that happens. See crashing the mode. We wrap the scene with a conversation between Brion, Dr. Jace, and the others, where it's revealed that the assassin who killed Marlo with the boulder may in fact be Brion's sister, Tara. Brion wants to rescue her immediately from the League, even though there's no confirmation of her involvement, but Dick convinces him to be patient. Or so he thinks. 
because then Brion, Halo, and Forager retreat to their new home, the Bioship, and Brion calls Dr. Jace to enlist her aid in helping Tara when they find her. Then the three leave on the super cycle to Infinity Island, home of the shadows. Just after they leave, Oracle informs Dick that Halo's real name was Gabrielle Dow, a Karaki refugee. When Artemis, Connor, and Dick go to tell her, they discover that the new team and the super cycle are gone. So we then cut to Brion, Forager, and Halo on Infinity Island, where they run into Sensei, the senior teacher to the League of Shadows. Sensei informs them that Tara is not on the island, much to Brion's dismay. And when Brion doesn't back down and attacks Sensei, Sensei defends himself. It doesn't take Miss Martian, Superboy, Black Lightning, and Nightwing long to realize where the new team team was headed and follow in the bioship. Sensei doesn't have much trouble holding his own against the new team, but is quickly joined by a ninja and a, in a red hood and Rachel Ghoul's bodyguard, Ubu, who is armed with apocalyptic weapons. The three take down the new team and throw them in a holding cell where they are soon rescued by Miss Martian and the others. After a short conflict, Raish reveals he is no longer the head of the shadows and that he is no longer part of the light. He then lets them all just leave the island. <laughs> With his permission. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> on the on the bioship, Brion apologizes. Nightwing dresses down Brion and the others, telling them they will not be doing this again. When the three of them insist that, one, they are staying together, and two, they feel like they'd be outsiders on the team, Nightwing tells them that their commitment is admirable and agrees to lead them. Reluctantly. <laughs> Our final scene is Artemis revealing to Halo that her real name was Gabrielle Dow, but after a brief flashback of Gabrielle entering Markovia and being verbally abused, Halo states that she is not Gabrielle and takes on the name Violet. Stuff happens in this episode. Stuff does happen in this episode. Yeah. That's I think that's kind of true for every episode, but... Pretty much. Pretty much, yep. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. Why don't you open up with the thing I know you want to open up with? <laughs> it's it's one of many things that I like and appreciate in this episode, but... There's a lot. So, Dick and Barbara are a thing. Hashtag Maneuver 7. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Technically not their ship name from decades of comic book history, but it's fine. I can't handle Dick Babs. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I... I didn't name the ship. This is just what they've been called. I'm just telling you. <laughs> you are my representative for all shippers. I'm sorry. I have, yes, Maneuver 7 is fine with me. Anyway, so, move on. They're a thing. They're canon they are. season. And they're, they're real cute. And we talked about this a bit in Scream Something, as is true for most of what we talk about in these episodes. But for me, what really makes this scene work is that it is super casual and it's this level of like casual intimacy that this scene needs for it to work in the way that it does. Because like they could have if they wanted to introduce that like Nightwing and Barbara are a thing this season. They could have had like them on a date or something like that. But that doesn't have the same impact as this because we need to see them like as what they usually are, as what they naturally are in a relationship. And this is exactly what that is. And that's like what we, we need. We need to see them not at like a level of being out in the world and having any level of performance in the way that they're interacting with each other. We just need to see them being cute. And I'm like, yeah, cool. I get what this relationship is now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> period. Nothing to add, Rich? How do you feel? How do you as a Shallant shipper feel? <laughs> I am I am excited about Shallant being what Shallant was, which was perfect. Kids having a relationship together, like 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 getting figuring their things out, right, in relationships, and still being friends after, and growing into adults and being responsible both as teenagers and as adults. I love that. It's great, and they both move on, and they're both doing their own things. But the the thing that I find interesting here is that there's um, there's a few issues, and one in particular there's a there's a uh, I think it was an issue of Nightwing where Dick and Barbara are talking about their potential relationship and what the deal is. And that's the, the basic in the tie in comics, you mean? No, in in the regular great uh, Nightwing comic. 
There oh, was okay. a there was a scene between Oracle in the wheelchair as Dick uh, Barbara as, as Oracle and Dick, and they're talking about their potential relationship. And her that's basically the the regular series equivalent of the scene we saw in the tie in comics where Barbara was like, "You're not you're not ready for me yet." Okay. Like you've got to you you got to do your thing, and I'm happy to have you do your thing and that kind of thing. But we're not ready to to move this forward yet. And so that was that thing where she turns him down, and that's kind of where they stay. Like they kind of have this flirty thing, but their moments of relationship are they're not. I don't know. They seem vague here, not vague at all. We know exactly <laughs> what's happening. Right. They've established yes. themselves as a relationship. It's a good, it looks like a good, healthy, fun relationship that, you know, and they're communicating well and they have mutual respect for one another. It's just fantastic. I love it. So I'm all I on board. I completely agree. <laughs> Sorry. I have like all kinds of other things going through my head now because I was just talking, I was just recording yesterday with Dylan, uh, Dylan Weaver, who's going to be a discussion episode that, excuse me, that comes up later. And we're talking about, we were talking about Donna Troy and how Donna and Dick in the comics had had a relationship. And I was wondering if that was a thing that happened over the five year break. <laughs> then I was like, well, what happens when Starfire shows up? Cause Starfire and, and Nightwing were my OTP when I was a teenager. And if Starfire shows up, what's that going to be about? And how's that going to affect Barbara? And then my heart broke a little bit. Yeah. I was on a roller coaster there for about five <laughs> seconds. I'm okay now. I'm, I'm better. I understand. Meanwhile, my, my brain was like, we could have an entire mission team that is just Nightwing's ex-girlfriends <laughs> at some point oh in my, the future. Oh my, that team would be rad. <laughs> yes. Because it would be Zatanna, Rocket, Riot, Barbara, Barbara Riot, Starfire, uh, Donna Troy. Bet Kane if Bet ever became a superhero. Right, that's right. If, when Bet, if Bet Kane becomes Firebird, if, if, right, Donna? <laughs> Donna, if that's a thing in this universe, you got six heroes. They could be a full like mission squad. Woo! Oh, and Nightwing's just like, oh god, this is awkward. <laughs> yes, I'm not convinced. I think I think Nightwing would be like, yeah, you're all toast. I know, <laughs> I know these women. <laughs> yeah, no, bye bye. Be- <laughs> yeah, I forget. I, always, I forget that Young Justice Nightwing is like, no, my one superpower is that me. I'm still friends with all. Of oh my yeah, exes. it's not I awkward. Was- they all know. Right, yeah. like they all seem to know, and that's clear communication and responsible action, in my opinion. So, um, also, you don't want to be on the on the the barrel end of that gun of that team. <laughs> <laughs> that team, just having Starfire and Donna Troy on a team, just the two of them. Plus, you're backed Starfire, up by Donna Troy, Zatanna. Right. Oh, and then I'm like, in addition to that, you've got Zatanna backing him up. Rocket's just going to put anybody like shut down the the biggest guns, right? <laughs> Oh God! I want this. Give me a now. I want it. I want it really bad. It's all of them. Young Justice okay. imprint, comic imprint. <laughs> it's the girls' night out issue. Right. I was gonna say birds of prey, and I was like, wait, no, that's already a thing. Wings that's of a thing. night. Wings of prey. No. <laughs> wings of prey. No. no. It's the ex girlfriend club. Is it? I think now I'm like, no, get Nightwing out of this. He should be in like the first <laughs> scene of the first uh, issue to make a joke. And then he should just remove himself <laughs> from the room. <laughs> so while we're over here writing our own fan fiction, uh, <laughs> moving on to other things from this episode that I love, we get we get Forager meeting everybody, and he's so cute, and Halo's so cute, and Brion is just trying to keep up with their adorableness. And that's a fun scene that we'll probably be talking about more <laughs> later. But I love it. And I love... I love that they have the moment where McGann both sticks up for and explains Forager's verbal tick of not using any pronouns. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's He's so an good. alien. It's- <laughs> His brain works differently. <laughs> yes, but it's so nice to have someone acknowledge like why he does that because yeah. like a lot of shows would just be like we need our alien to sound different. Right. What can we do to make them sound different whereas the show is like Okay, one that, but also what is the explanation for it? And it's that they have a complex sense of self. And I'm like, oh, that's just endearing and adorable. I'm yeah. here for it. Right. And I like that McGann, being the one who has complex alien like understandings of communication and presentation of self, is like, yeah, no, I get this. This is fine. But uh, that same thing, I really love that they have Artemis, Connor, and McGann having like, 
the telepathic conversation away from the kids where it used to be like, this is how we hide our conversations from adults. Right. And now they're like, okay, the grownups need to talk. Kids move along. Right. Uh, and it's just nice and nostalgic. And I really, I, <laughs> the first time I watched this, I'm pretty sure I choked laughing at Connor's like offhanded, yeah, those nights in the cave were pretty, pretty special. special line. Mm-hmm. Because it goes by so fast, but you're like, okay then, Connor. Okay. <laughs> I was I was genuinely half expecting Artemis to be like, oh my god, you guys stop. <laughs> just mentally, just to have her be like, guys, guys, no, not right I now. Kind of, I kind of feel like Artemis would have been just like, uh huh. <laughs> you know, I just feel like Artemis would of of anyone on the team. I think Artemis would have been like. I bet, or something. Like I, I think, like she would roll with it. Like Beast Boy would be like, "Excuse me, <laughs> I do not want any of that." Thank you. In my head. No, you say you saying that made me think that you would assume Artemis would be like, "Yeah, no, I know me and Wally, et cetera, et cetera." Oh, also would have been great. <laughs> See, this scene would do oh more than God. one thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then break my heart thinking about Wally. Ah. Oh. Again, with the emotional roller coaster. But (laughs) along with that same scene, I also really love that when Forager is like, I think they're just trying to figure out what to do with me. And Brion and Halo both go, yeah, they do that a lot. (laughs) Because that is literally their entire arc this season so far. It's just a bunch of adults being like, what do we do with these kids? (laughs) Right. That's the only experience they've ever had with this team exactly like we're like they don't do that a lot we've seen three seasons of them this isn't normal and they're like no this is literally the only thing we've seen them do for the entire stretch that we have been in this show i'm like yeah you're right from your perspective they do this a lot (laughs) and in this this scene that has a bunch of these little nice nostalgic nods for me back to season one we also get mcgann saying hello megan oh yeah we get a hello megan the only so far, I think is the only one not to not to crash the mode, but I think it's the only time we've heard it this season. I think that's that's uh, a fair. Like season two had like one in it. Season three gets one. Like after season one, they have like they're like there's a tiny there's a jar of like you get three Hello Megans for the season. <laughs> Use them wisely. Right. I really love this scene. I love that the bio ship is the car, and that. <laughs> you called it. That was it. something I predicted by accident. Uh, but Nailed I do it. like it. I like that Bioship can do that. I like that Bioship is seemingly evolving, I guess, to the right. point that she can just look like other stuff. Because why not? <laughs> it's cool. Uh, alien technology. It can do whatever we need it to within reason. <laughs> and we see her do other things later, too. We do. We yeah. do. No, no crashing the mode, but yes. <laughs> and along the same lines I love that Jefferson's so freaked out by it like everyone on the team is just like yeah this is Bioship right. she's part of the team and Jefferson's like <laughs> what is part of the thing? team for like eight years yeah she Bioship has been part of the team longer than Artemis and Artemis <laughs> is like yeah this is just this is our ride this is we a, take it this is our, <laughs> it's totally true Super Cycle Wolf Bioship there's no reason why anyone on the team would think they're not just other members of the team (laughs) right and of course jefferson how long has he even worked with them right he hasn't we don't know we don't know right he worked he's worked with well he's worked with mcgann because static's part of the team so i mean there's some connection there but he's not nearly as used to it which is pretty funny and the fact that he calls it that he calls bioship a thing and mcgann is like no stop (laughs) yeah that is that is not the correct pronoun thank you so much (laughs) And then he has this whole thing where he's where he's like, I don't know what to call the Super Martian residence. He's like Mars Town, and Connor's like, What are you talking about? I just, it's hilarious to me. I've somewhere I've found when writing notes for this episode that in my old Scream Something notes way back when I some somewhere along the lines referred to it as the alien pillow fort with an intergalactic uh, petting zoo. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a, it's a mouthful, but very accurate. Because <laughs> sometimes a family is an alien, a half Kryptonian clone, a biogenetically engineered wolf, a sphere from another distant planet, and a spaceship. And that is a family, and it's okay. Right. And apple trees. 
and Lucas Carr. <laughs> and some apple trees and Lucas Carr. Right. Sometimes, maybe. <laughs> right. Uh, but yes. And then we get into the main plot of this episode that is Forager and Brion and Halo going to Infinity Island. And the kids just bailing on everything and going exactly where they were told not to go is such peak season one Young Justice. I love it. I love having it back. I love getting to see that again. Yep. Oh, it's so good. And <laughs> and this is and this is the thing. Just sorry, I want to take a quick sidestep because yeah, we're not it. gonna talk about we're not gonna talk about this in Canary Debrief, but it's important. When you're doing sequels, same but different. Exactly. You want echoes of ideas that people are used to, themes and ideas, but twist them, turn them on their head, make them different, involve different characters in different ways and have them come to similar conclusions for different reasons. Um, don't make it feel like we're just rehashing the storyline again, right? Absolutely. And even if you are using the exact same plot arcs, you can make it feel different by changing enough things and making it new and interesting. So same but different, right? And I this completely is completely agree. Perfect. And then having having nods back to things like Yeah. <laughs> does Cadmus ring a bell? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I hate being the grown up. <laughs> That's my favorite line in the whole episode <laughs> is Nightwing's just completely resigned. God, I hate being the grown up. I love it. It's so good. <laughs> With that scene when they first leave, I also love this watch through. It just kind of dawned on me and connected with me that I'm like, all Sphere did for several years was take a bunch of teenagers to weird places with no adult supervision. So this is totally normal for her. <laughs> She's on board with this. She's like, uh -huh. She's like, oh yeah, no, this is what I've done for 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 my dude for years. Of <laughs> right, course, right, come on, right. strange children, let's go. Uh, and also, I just had, I just kept having a lot of season one thoughts this episode. Apparently, when I was rewatching it, because. Halo has a line where she's like, how Artemis is Tigress on the mission, but Artemis at home. And I'm like, Halo would have been so confused by <laughs> season one. <laughs> I totally didn't think about that. That's so funny. Uh, Wait, so it's like, so Superboy's Connor when he's not on a mission, but Superboy on a mission. And Artemis, what's your yeah. code name? <laughs> Artemis. Yeah. What? <laughs> but what she wasn't confused about is that Super so Superboy's name changes. But his clothes don't. No. <laughs> he likes his t-shirt. Sorry, pal. This counts. <laughs> oh, we're just, oh, we're just having too much, too many jokes. <laughs> so many jokes. Bits on bits on bits. Every, every which way. <laughs> every which uh, way. <laughs> to go on to something that is less of a joke that I do really love about this episode is that there is an ongoing theme and conversation in this episode, but kind of across the whole season so far, about how all of the original teammates are adults now, and they're the adults in the room and <laughs> right. have to act like it, right. but they're still all really young and confused and don't really know what they're doing when it comes to being an adult. And it's kind of great. I kind of, I, I love it. Are you trying to imply you might relate to some of this in some way, or? Maybe. Maybe. But I think, but... I think that applies to the fandom as a whole in a lot of ways. In yeah, that for sure. The, how the show was initially aimed at, like, at a younger audience, and as that audience yeah. has grown and aged over the years, so have these characters, and we've all kind of caught back up to them. People who were thirteen watching season one, <laughs> me included, oh, wait, are you're, now you're back being about the same age as Dick. Right? I am, yes. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, I can relate to you again in some ways. I get it now. Uh, wow. The same way that like, as time has gone on, I appreciate season two more and more as I get older in a lot of ways. And I think that applies to season three in a lot of ways where I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. all of you are now, because they're not the league and they're not like the real adults, quote unquote, but they are like, they have more responsibility and they are trying to be the adults in the room, but they keep running into things like Dick going, I hate being the grown up. And I'm like, yeah, of course you do. You're 20. You don't know how to be a grown up, but everyone needs you to be right now. And that is a weird state to be in that is really interesting to see explored on a show that is about young heroes. Yeah. Discussion of themes this season instead of me just making jokes about season one. <laughs> 
But also, like this this episode overall is a really nice throwback to season one because we also get to see like all of the not all of the original team, but several members of the original team fighting together in a way that we haven't really seen up to this point like we get a little bit of it in those first three episodes Uh but that is like all of them are kind of on separate missions in that whereas this is all of them fighting alongside each other and we get superboy and we get miss martian and nightwing and artemis all doing their thing and then in the middle of that we also have like them trying to incorporate the new kids the outsider kids who don't know how to work with the adults in the room, which is really fun and interesting. And you get things like Brion using his powers, just trying to be like, I'm going to be helpful. And he accidentally knocks Miss Martian out in the middle of the fight, (laughs) which derails everything for a minute because nobody told Brion, hey, you can't light yourself on fire next to the person (laughs) who's allergic to fire. And I love it. And it's one of the, and it also shows us like those nice bits of character of Brion being that, kind of brash impulsive i'm just gonna do this thing and not check with anyone and you get like superboy immediate yeah and you get superboy who immediately tries to run to miss martian and in doing that gets attacked by the apocalyptic tech and all and nightwing is off doing his thing fighting with a ninja and they're all having these moments that show their character in a really nice way for a big fight scene that could have just been a big fight scene yeah that random ninja guy just one ninja on the whole island We'll get to him. It's crazy. He's not a person. He's just a he's just a ninja. He's just a red hooded ninja. It's fine. <laughs> but rewatching this episode again, I realized when they when Halo gets her neck snapped, uh, because that's a thing, and gets thrown into the cell with uh, Brion and Forager, Brion like freaks out, and I'm like, did nobody tell? Brion, the extent of Halo's healing powers? Yeah, this time that I was watching through with this, I was thinking the same thing, and I'm like, okay, when, number one, I don't know if they told him that they she was a dead body at some point. <laughs> number two, there was a whole fog cloud thing going on, like a smoke cloud from Dick at the time that he she woke up, and it was only Jace and Artemis who saw her wake up and regenerate from Plasmus' yep. attack. And then, of course, Forger would have no idea. <laughs> So, like, yes. I think you're right. I think it never came up, right? So, oops. Because the more I think about it, the more I'm reminded of the fact that they never really intended for this group to be a superhero To be a group. Team. Yeah, that's fair. So, they didn't, yeah. they weren't like, oh, we need to, like, sit you down and explain training at this point. They just <laughs> right. kind of let it slide. And that makes perfect sense. Nobody brought it up. It does make perfect sense. But I only now realized it on this watch that I'm like, Wow, no one told Brio. <laughs> right. right. And in that that whole big fight sequence we were talking about, we get to random crazy fun Easter egg that I found during Scream Something and Rich can explain all the backstory of. <laughs> Jeez, I won't okay, uh, I'll do but that. <laughs> <laughs> there is on this island during this big fight scene, people may have noticed that Sensei has a weird glowing sword. And you're like, that's a weird glowing sword. Why Why is he trying to attack Connor when Connor is invulnerable? It's actually one of the only weapons in the comics that can hurt Connor. And it's from issues 9 and 10 of the co- tie-in comics. And Rich, want to explain what it is? <laughs> sure. For those of you who haven't listened to everything we've done, um, <laughs> it is, it's called the Exionizer Blade. And it is it was a sword... So in the tie-in comics, the first time we saw it in the 9 and 10, it was being used by a villain uh, named, I believe his name was just Samurai. And he, um, the the blade was made from the same metal that the starship was made of, that Captain Adam's suit is made out of, that contains his energy form. We're not quite sure which version of Cap this is. I'm assuming it's the Greg Weissman version. So... It's designed to cut through that armor that Captain Adam has. The side effect is that it also cuts through lots of really <laughs> tough things. And in the in the tie-in comics, we see it slash Superboy across the chest. And we see blood in that scene. So he, he gets hurt by it and he knows what it is. I saw it glowing and I was like, that blade looks really weird. Didn't even think about it because I don't know why. And then Emily's like, oh, look what that is. I was like, oh, <laughs> 
<laughs> blew my head off. And then it, <laughs> Sam... It took me three watch throughs to notice it. But once I noticed it, I was like, oh, this scene makes so much more sense now. <laughs> I brought this up on The Daily Show, the DC Daily Show. And I was like, oh, it's the Xionizer blade that was made from the blah, 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 blah. And Sam Humphreys was just was like mocking me. He's like, and it was also from Thanagar. And it was also spent a year here. And it's also been in the possession of. And I was just like, dude, seriously, I don't know all the history of this weapon. But all of that may actually be true. And I... and. I remember this when this first got brought up and people first kind of like realized this and were talking about it on Twitter. Christopher Jones like shared it and tagged Greg Weissman and was like, "Is this what is I think? that sword? What I think it is?" <laughs> right. And Greg was like, "Yeah." And someone's like, "Do you think Superboy like realized that?" And I think Greg's only response was, "You don't forget the one sword that can hurt you." <laughs> right? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, because the way they the way they drew it the way that they animated this scene superboy has a reaction the second he realizes that sword is in play <laughs> yes and miss martian is the one who saves him and i'm right. like oh both of you remember oh, yeah, what this is for sure and that's what i was like why she grabbed sensei i guess it's kind of interesting but who cares like sensei it's just a sword yeah he can throw superboy around fiance, but he's, not gonna... he's fine it's glowing but that couldn't mean anything <laughs> I don't know what, oh, what? It's the I'm one mocking my that could kill I'm, connor i'm mocking myself because i'm like why didn't i even think about. I just I'd forgotten about the Xionizer blade. I think. Anyway, but then we get to that ending Bioship scene that I love and you love and we all love of just all of the little things happening in that scene on the Bioship at the very end. From the fact that Brion is now in Superboy's clothes that don't fit, and that just implies that they just have a stash of Connor's clothes on the Bioship because this is a problem that happens every other mission. <laughs> Right. They have Nightwing quoting Batman that is so good and we get that we get that nice little season one throwback. Right. This whole this whole episode was a nice little do do the season one thing but different. Right. One of the things that's different, which one, I think it's hilarious that Brion of all people is in Superboy's clothes because <laughs> they're just he's he's Superboy of season three. But <laughs> instead of having Brion like You're right. Instead of having Brion take all the beats of Superboy and saying, like, get on board or get out of the way, you know, he starts off with, like, this was my fault. Yeah. And I, I'm i sorry about that. Like, you start yeah. to see it, – it's kind of like Brion – to me, it's it's Brion's uh, equivalent of Superboy and Schooled, where we start to see that Brion does have other qualities – that are that are alive underneath and may have been very active in the first 18 years of his life, 17 years of his life, but that are right now, you know, being overridden by these terrible terrible things that have happened to his family and to his country and to his brother and to his uncle and himself and his sister and gee, poor guy, you know. <laughs> Trust me, right? Like the 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 boy's got some stuff going on. So it yeah. still feels the same. And then also that scene too, playing off of that, that's the thing that I I didn't notice till after a couple of times watching was, I think it was Halo saying like, we would be, I think we'd feel like outsiders on the team. And I was like, there, yeah. there it is. <laughs> there it is. I knew it was coming. I just couldn't figure out how. And that was it. Right. Yeah. Which is, which is great. So again, they're not like def being defiant, even respectfully defiant as Aqualad was in that episode. But they're just saying, like, look, we have nowhere else to go, and we're a family now. We're we're becoming a family now, and this matters to us. And that's all that all that Dick needs to hear. You know, I love it. Absolutely, and I do, and I do really love that the second Dick realizes, like, oh, you kids need to stay together. He's like, okay, we'll make it work. Like he doesn't like Batman needed to take three days and think about it and come up with a plan, and Nightwing's just like, yeah, we'll figure it out. It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I and just like that, you're leading another team. <laughs> Don't uh. remind me, because uh, as we said last episode, Nightwing has like a genetic disposition to be part of right. teams, and no matter how much he fights it, it doesn't work. Yeah. Boys got to be on a team. You can't fight the extrovert. Um, <laughs> Dick's an extrovert. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, uh, and I. And one of the little things in that scene that I really like, I like how there is a moment where all of the kids start talking and Nightwing's just like, no, wait, stop. <laughs> because they're like, they, because Connor starts to explain like what happened at Cadmus and <laughs> Forager's like, I met Kid Flash. And they're all just <laughs> starting to the same having kid Flash. Moment. Right. 
It's not the same kid. No, stop. And it's just like this moment where Nightwing's like, dear God, were we this bad? (laughs) Were we this much? We can't not mention Jason Spizak as Forager saying, I met Kid Flash. (laughs) It's a different Kid Flash. (laughs) Forager met Kid Flash. Why? Well, oh, yes, you did. So good. <laughs> you did, but not that Kid Flash. Different Kid Flash. The Kid Flash you voiced. Um. <laughs> yes, and also, yes, you are him. Also, you are Kid Flash. Yes, it's, it's so good. I I love it. I really <laughs> enjoy this episode. What do you What do you got to share, Rich? Um, that we have. There are lots of there's about. lots of little things that I I love too, and like the Jason Spizak line, but also, um, <laughs> I love how Dick like. Uh, I don't want to say defends Raish, but gets like angry a little bit. He, he's got a little edge to his voice when he's like, Raish al Ghul is many things, but he's not a liar. And I'm like, bam, that right there, that, that is the quality of an, of an impressive antagonist where the hero, where it had that antagonist has a, some redeeming quality, some thing <laughs> that you can look at. And that Dick has respect for, like we have fought and yeah. we have had to stop you from doing things, but I understand you and you have never in the decade plus of us, you know, fighting you, have you ever lied? Right. And so it, it matters because in this scene, he says two crazy things, <laughs> right? He's no longer yeah. head of the shadows or involved with the light at all. Like, really? Like, why, why would that possibly be? And and then it led me onto this other like thought process. Like, does that mean the shadows have been an organization that's been run by the light the entire time and not like in the comics been established by Raish? And that Raish was only put in put in the position of being head of the shadows by the light's council. And so it's easy for them to switch out leaders. And so if that's the case, is the shadows supposed to be and a young justice allusion to the light and the shadows, because that's a crazy connection that is rad if that's what's going <laughs> on with that. So we're the light and this is our covert ops, op, you know, group that's going to take care of business for us. And they're the shadows, right? I, something connection I never even occurred to me. <laughs> I'm sure somebody or it occurred to someone before me, but uh, in the comics and other media, the shadows are created specifically by race. So, I don't know. And then we get this one ninja. And at first we get this ninja and he's just this ninja. And I'm like, okay, it's a ninja and Ubu. And there's like one ninja left. And it wasn't until the end that we're like, oh, of course, of course, that ninja is someone because everyone, because everyone's someone. We're just like, how do we, how do we skirt around crashing this mode? Right. I also love in the same vein about Raish being a villain that can that appeals to a lot of people as as an antagonist like someone who's like you know when you say who's your favorite batman villain there's a lot of people who will say joker there's a lot of people who will say raish and because there's some aspect to him he's so anti joker almost yeah. which makes the batman under the red hood movie so interesting with their their um difference of how they do things but sensei's the same way sensei doesn't start that fight <laughs> <laughs> Sensei repeatedly is like, if you just leave the island, we can all go on our way. You came here to find her. She's not here. You can move on. He's like, maybe, maybe she doesn't want to be around you. I've known you for five minutes <laughs> and I can, <laughs> I can already relate to this feeling or whatever he says, like mangled that line, but really funny. And he doesn't until, until Brianna attacks him. Right. Yeah. So then you've got like, okay, who's the, who's the antagonist here? Right. Who's, who's the one that's breaking into somebody's house and taking, Taking them down. Since they, since and they destroying te- their meditation space. Right. <laughs> Keon Young is so funny as Sensei. His dry sense of humor is so good. Uh-uh, none of that. Yeah. Um, I trained the army. It's, Which is such a good it's line. It's so good. So good. Um, and then just the fact that he's like, all right, I may not be able to take Breon down, but he's never going to touch me. And I'll take everyone, or everyone down around him. He literally grabs Forager while he's charging at him and throws him in a different direction. It's so good. Yep. Um, and we haven't gotten to see that part of Sensei. Like, I think he's got like a couple of lines in season one. And one of the lines is, who do we have in Happy Harbor? I think that's his only <laughs> line, right? The whole time. So, yeah. 
anyway, it was great to see him, but also great to see this antagonist where when Dick finally shows up and knows both sides of what's happening and he's like, I think it's time for us to go. Right? Like, we're done now. Or <laughs> when Artemis is like, is it my dad? Ha <laughs> ha, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, okay. So we know, we definitely know it's not Sportsmaster, but when she says my sister and he's all, and the camera like zooms in on his eyes a little bit and he's all, get out. <laughs> <laughs> like, I you, that you can't tell if it's like, no, she is involved or really he's just done with you people in his house. Get out of my house. Stop asking questions. Get, get, off, out, my get off my island. <laughs> I'm giving you, how many times do I have to ask you? To politely leave my island and stop destroying my <laughs> meditation platforms. Right. But also what's interesting is they see Halo regenerate herself. So Ration sense Sensei was like, I she's she was dead. <laughs> like I'm not yeah. she was dead, dead. I felt her life leave her body, kind of a thing, which is creepy and weird. But <laughs> Ray saying, Oh, regenerate, you know, reincarnation is not unheard of. <laughs> But I, we haven't even – have we seen a Lazarus Pit? In the comics. Oh, in the comics we saw the Lazarus Pit. That's right. Because that's also the thing that created Matt Hagen's clay face. That's right. <laughs> Which is interesting on a whole different level. Anyway, so there's lots of little scenes in there, little bits of character development, dialogue, and combat. There's a bunch of stuff in this combat that shows character, right? And, and Yeah. Include like the stuff you're talking about, like like Brion lighting up and then having Martian pass out, and Superboy going at her and being grabbed. Um, who was it? I had somebody. I just retweeted something on Twitter yesterday. Yes, I saw it about I, about combats needing to build character. Was that Chuck Wendig? Yes. Who did I? Who did I retweet? Do you remember? It was uh, John Rogers. Oh, that's right, John Rogers. So yeah, uh, I retweeted this thing on Twitter. It was uh, John Rogers who was one of the co-creators of the Jaime Reyes Blue Beetle. Um, he was talking about, uh, he was making reference to, he had quote tweeted something else even that uh, was about combats build character. You can show character through combats. It's just a different type of conflict. Conflict is a space in which to highlight, highlight character. And this whole, the whole fight scene does that, including, including these conclusions of the fight scene, which is Ray showing up and saying, that's enough. Right. So every beat of every con- – so if you're going to put fight scenes in – we got a couple of mini <laughs> mini debriefs here. If you're going to put fight scenes into whatever you're writing, use it. Don't just – don't let this opportunity go away. You can get no. real deep into characters' personalities by using that. I personally, to bring in my theater background for a moment, I a lot of the time in a really weird way that people who aren't familiar with theater might not understand – think about fight scenes in the same way I think about musical numbers in musicals, which makes perfect sense to me. And it's about the fact that fight scenes like musical numbers should not just be there to look cool. They have to advance the plot or reveal more about your characters. Hopefully do both. And they're the same sort of thing in that they are these big spectacles in the middle of your story but you should not be grinding the plot to a halt for a minute to go everybody punch each other or everybody do a little dance. You have to be continuing with your plot and with the characters that you have to make it unique and interesting and contributing to your story. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So in, in, with all that, let's <laughs> head into the mid-roll, come back from the mid-roll, and we will do some uh, Canary Debrief. Uh, and some fan service and crashing the mode. Let's do it. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. We love feedback and tasty tidbits our listeners keep giving us between our shows, and this week I want to share a couple of good ones. Henry Giardinelli shared some great info on Stargirl and Stripe that we mentioned recently. Content warning for this one, um, there is a mention of a plane crash tragedy. Stargirl was created by Jeff Johns, who apparently based her personality after his sister, Courtney, who died tragically in the explosion of TWA Flight 800 in 1996. We're so sorry, Jeff. Um, I did not know this. Um, Other things I didn't know is that her costume is apparently based off of Yankee Poodle, a character from Captain Carrot and the Zoo Crew, 
who Chris Newton and I talked about during our discussion on Shazam. Uh, Stripe's alter ego is Pat Dugan. The character was created in 1941, and he was the first adult sidekick to a teenage superhero. But he didn't start out as Courtney's stepdad. Uh, Apparently, he later married Courtney's mom after several adventures. Over on YouTube, we're having some people leaving comments for us as well, and we hugely appreciate that. We have not been on YouTube as long, obviously, as we've been a podcast, so spreading the word over there means a lot to us. Matt's Martinson gave us some really interesting information regarding our Elseworlds Gotham by Gaslight episode. Matt says, By the turn of the century, Germany, England, and the States had motorcycles. Hildebrand and Wolf Mueller in 1894, Excelsior in 1896, and Orient Aster in 1898, so it's not quite as steampunk as one might think for Bruce Wayne to have one a few years before they were publicly available. Thanks again to Henry and Matt's. There's no way we can know everything about 80 years of DC history. We do our best, and we certainly don't get everything right either, so we love hearing these tidbits we missed. Keep them coming. Also, a new quick five-star review. Best show ever from Rebsoth First. I'm going to pronounce it that way. I would give 100 out of 10 if I could. Cannot recommend it enough. Best podcast ever. Love, Beck, all the way from Australia. Thank you, Beck, and everyone who's taken the time to write a review. As our friend Senda from She's a Super Geek says, reviews are like a hug for podcasters, and we appreciate everyone. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. All right. In our Canary Debriefs, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. Um, We've already mentioned a couple of things earlier, uh, but today for our official Canary Debrief, I'm going to put my gamer hat on about introducing new characters to a party or a team or even new characters to a story or novel. If you've ever run a game and had to facilitate introducing a new player character or PC um, or played in a game where you brought in a new character, you know that the first thing out of the cliche trunk is all the players know each other. The players know that this character is being played by a player. So the response is, well, hello, you look trustworthy, though we've never met before and probably have no reason to trust you because of however your character was built, but let's be friends and do this thing together. And that's not, (laughs) that doesn't, it doesn't work great, period. It's not great for a character development either. Forager, a, a literal bug alien from another world, he's immediately accepted into the fold. So at first glance, this might look like what the players of Halo and Brion and Forager did. But if you look a little closer, it's not. Halo is a friendly character. Yeah, that's great. But we also know that she has an affection for for Sphere, who is a sapient alien technology. (laughs) There's something about her deep down that feeds that character's desire and openness, even excitement, about meeting Forager, which tells us a lot about her character beyond that she's just friendly. She also spouts out details about his culture, which is interesting in the scene, but also for everyone around and for, you know, the other players at the table, or in this case, the watcher. Brion starts the scene fascinated by the fact that Forager is a real alien, which is a little bit off the cliche shelf, but okay, especially since there are literal other aliens standing right next to him and they try to point that out. Um, But what bonds him together actually is much more character driven, which is the emotional bond of both being exiles from their home and wanting to go home. So the players of Brion and Halo and Forager took time to think, one, I, you know, I'm in this game with other players, so whatever character I make has to have a reason to be here. <laughs> I don't need to force other people to to tell me or convince me why I'm here. And two, what bond can I find? What connection can I find as the player between my character and other characters in this group? Now, some games like Masks and other PBTA games and Fate and some others have things that are set up in the character generation to build these bonds ahead of time, which is really nice. But if you're playing in a system where that doesn't exist, then you need to take a, take a look at that. And with hierarchical games like Dungeons and Dragons, the bonding of a group together it, it just historically seems to reflexively fall on the game master or dungeon master in the case of D&D. But this is an instinct that, in my opinion, needs to be looked at and broken. Everyone is at the table to participate in the story together. So as a player, it's my job to find a way to connect my character with others. It's not other people's job to, to do that for me. Uh, or if I'm not sure how, bring it up at the table and talk it through. Um, maybe I want to have a character that starts as a loner, like Brion does, and goes through an arc of character growth, which is great. It's amazing. But talking it through with the other players before, or at least while that's happening, so that they understand the perspective that you're coming at it from, 
involves everyone in the process and removes the weight from the game master's shoulders and the other players to connect the dots and removes the weight from the other players uh, to find out what will quote unquote make your character participate. And with that, we got some fan service. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. I actually have some fan service this week. Emily's been carrying lots of fan service recently, but in fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan related creations, celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works that we think Young Justice fans will love. And this week, I have uh, Denise Zhang. So at Denise Fanta on Twitter. She has some pretty amazing artwork, and I can't remember who re... I think it was Zeno Robinson uh, retweeted this piece of artwork, which was a piece with Cyborg. (laughs) He's got a t-shirt on, says a hoodie that says Borg Life. He's got like a gray uh, duster on. It just looks great. I love it. And then when I went to uh, Denise's uh, Twitter page, and we also have a link... We also have a link to their lofter.com. I don't know what that is. And there's some other artwork there. So we'll have some some links to that. Did you, sorry, did you see that piece that I that I linked? Yeah, yeah. No, it's fantastic. A lot of their stuff is, I was scrolling through some of it earlier and was like, wow, this is just so good. Yeah. I know uh, Sarah Fuzzle and and uh, Zena Robinson and both kind of had shared it and commented about it, which put it on our radar. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, their stuff is so good. Yeah, awesome. All right, we got modes to crash. Let's do this. We can wrap up this trip. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Uh, Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season three, but in Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on tinfoil hats, I think is what I'm now calling it. These spoilers will be based (laughs) on only the first 13 episodes because that's what we've seen. Uh, If you are spoiler wary, this is your warning. Would you like to do our requisite every crashing the mode? Ah, uh, yes. So, so Halo is a mother box. <laughs> right. uh, check that off the list. But this this episode does have some more hints about it. She she knows about New Genesis. She knows about Forager's homeworld. She does her whole healing thing. Her and Sphere can communicate. She has that moment where she's like, she calls Sphere good girl or something like that, and Forager's like. How do you know Sphere is a girl? <laughs> right. She's just like, isn't it obvious? <laughs> right. And then it's a throwback to Forager saying the same thing about Bioship, which yeah. is great. And there, this time through, I noticed that there is a Forager line that when you first hear it, like, oh, that's just an adorable, nice little Forager line where he says, uh, is Halo a new god when she, when she comes back to life after dying? But also, yeah, kind of, <laughs> a little bit. She is, actually. It also makes you think, like, can other new gods do this, or do they just have mother boxes to help them with it? That's a real question right there. Interesting. Interesting. Also, is it, like, do do the new gods, like, are they immortal? I have questions now. <laughs> right. Uh, yes. I think they are. They haven't aged sure. in the five, seven years <laughs> right. that they've arrived. Well, that's true. Arrived. That's true. That's so true. So who knows? <laughs> That's a whole different rabbit hole to fall down. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so we also have this, in these flashbacks at the end, there's a character that throws a bottle at Halo. That character in the credits is listed as Wilhelm Vittings. According to the DC fandom page, Vittings was an ambitious government official in Markovia, and with the help from an American businessman, he stood for the election as prime minister. So... So I don't know what, if that's going to come up at some point because he looked a little bit young <laughs> at that point, but it's possible that that same character might show up a little bit later. Let's see. It looks like in the comics, he was also involved a little bit with Baron Bedlam and the potential coup that would happen in the comics as well. I don't know. So we'll, so who knows? So who knows? We'll see if he, that character comes back at some point. Also, the Red Hooded Ninja. Could we have said Red Hooded any more times during this episode? Yeah, so at the very end, in case you didn't see, that red-hooded ninja says, Grayson, and Raish says, 
<laughs> Ray says, "Oh, I see some of your memories are coming back." Um, this is what yep. I. This is what rev- the thing that popped into my head earlier was. Uh, he's like, "Oh, reincarnation happens. It just usually needs to involve a Lazarus pit, and then we get Jason Todd <laughs> in this episode." <laughs> So, and hmm. I think I think he says resurrection. Oh, resurrection! Oh, yeah, right. Resur- because those resur- are technically two different. They things. are technically different things. I'm a reincarnationist. You think I'd use the right word? <laughs> so, also, when you go back and rewatch it, it's kind of cool because it was it was Dick and Jason fighting, yeah, uh, which was very cool. We also get little baby Damien, little baby Damien Wayne. Yep. shows up as well. People who've listened to our comics commentaries. <laughs> Should or who haven't should go back and listen to us have like a ten minute discussion of whether or not Damian Wayne could have existed in comics at the end of season two. We did so much math. We did. We did a lot of math. You did a lot. The of general math. consensus. Yes, I sat down and did a bunch of math for a superhero show <laughs> to prove that Damian could not exist at that time by the point that that comic was happening. That's right. And then, of course, later on, we also see uh, Jonathan Kent. Um, So we've got Damien and Jonathan. And Jonathan looks like he's probably not more than a year old either. Year, year and a half, maybe. Um, So they're about this. They're within a year, two years of each other at the most. So, you know, whatever. Season six. Give me me that Super Sons (laughs) spinoff series. Season six, they join the team. Connor has to deal with like his little, little nephew. Right. Connor's still looking 16 years old. <laughs> that would be interesting. Okay, now, I, now I'm falling down a rabbit hole. <laughs> oh, yeah? Of Connor having to deal with ti- with tiny baby Superman. Because, <laughs> dear God. Yeah. Because Connor's good with kids. We know this yeah. because of <laughs> because of misplaced. That's right. Oh, God, I'm falling down a rabbit hole. Stop me. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> yes. Just live in that rabbit hole for a minute. It's good. It's good work. It would be a good, cute episode in six more seasons. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, but I, I, I think that's it, really. Oh, wait. Oh, uh, let's see. Neil had something I was going to couch in Crashing the Mode. Oh, he said someone really likes The Shining because <laughs> there's definitely a where's Jackie and from the Black Spider at the beginning. And then, of course, later on, we get the whole basic horror movie episode <laughs> as well. And then he also makes a comment about Barbara has the good goggles on. Oops. They're good. Yeah. And it's as fine. we mentioned, like later on, like they detect the metagene and then they do the mind control thing. But since they apparently know everyone's secret identities, thanks to home fires, <laughs> uh, do they know Barbara? They must know Barbara as Batgirl, I'm assuming. And so if they do and she's got the good goggles on and I don't know, there could be a thing where she is, I don't even know. Oy, oy, oy. Yeah. There's so much anxiety wrapped up in these <laughs> VR goggles. Oh, exactly. Oy. We'll see. We're just sitting here like, what's the worst thing that could possibly <laughs> happen? Because that's what they'll do. Times three. Right, exactly. Uh, all right. So and I think that wraps up. If I, Unless you have enough, do you have any more crashing the mode? No, I think that's I think, I think that that's pretty much everything. hits it. So, all right. And with all that, then I think we can say to Out of the Watchtower this week. Thank you all for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode. On Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining us in our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. So if you send us a quick little message, it'll make it a lot easier for us. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember... Stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. 
Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.